Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Kaisa, and thank you for inviting me here to talk about my work in India. And a few minutes at the end, I'll connect that to the work I'm currently doing at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Uh, but first, I'll start out in India, where I did uh, research uh, for my PhD, uh, which I did at the American University. Uh, here you see an area in northwestern India where they do agroforestry. Uh, I have small captions to all the pictures, and some of the pictures I'll elaborate on. Others are as a background information. First, I'll explain a little why I became interested in this topic. I've been interested in agriculture and food production all my life, I would say, from my grew up and we had a kitchen garden at home. In the late 90s, I evaluated the food program for UNDP in Ecuador. Uh, it's a, it was a program where they gave the kids biscuits and a drink. It was a useful program because many of the children was uh, were malnourished, but at the same time, it's what you call a band aid. It helps them survive uh, in the day-to-day -day life, but it's not a solution. Uh, later, after my master, I went uh, on to work as a researcher. I'm a medical anthropologist, by the way, I forgot to say. So my focus in food and agriculture has been on the health aspect of it. So I worked as a medical anthropologist at the Hispanic Health Council in Hartford, uh, Connecticut for four years. Uh, one large project was on HIV prevention and drug use among migrant farm workers. What we realized working with the migrant workers was that what actually was an equal or almost as large health issue was skin problem and other health issues due to pesticide. Uh, which sometimes were sprayed in the field uh, while the workers were working. These were large tobacco farms in Connecticut, and the tobacco production uses a lot of pesticides. Uh, one of the reasons there are so many migrant workers in the U.S. is, of course, because they, don't, they, lose, they have lost their job or they don't have the same opportunities at home. Uh, this year, we celebrate, but not with the positive, uh, not a positive celebration for many, the NAFTA agreement, which you might have heard of, North American Free Trade Agreement, which linked uh, Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. in 1994. Uh, it was not a positive uh, experience for many of the Mexican uh, farmers who due to heavy corn imports, subsidized corn imports from the U.S., could not compete with those imports and went out of business. And a few of them could go into industries in Mexico, but that was a minor mi uh, minority, and most of them had to look for work uh, elsewhere. So all these uh, issues are connected to today's food production. Uh, there is enough food, but we still have malnourished children in all parts of the world. And uh, the food uh, uh, industry is dominated by a few large companies. Uh, on this picture, you see a couple of kids sitting in a manual mill in Dehradun, one of the northern states I worked in in India. So uh, when I, s uh, yeah, I had uh, gotten a little into my uh, research on uh, the food uh, issue in India, that was uh, before the food crisis came in 2008. And since that, we have had uh, rising prices, which has caused problems for many poor all over the world. Uh, the rise in prices is complex. It's, uh, caused by many things, but one is certainly the higher cost for energy, mechanical cultivation, uh, the high price of inputs, uh, shifts in cultivation, many places towards subsidized biofuel, and not least the grains used to feed livestock for meat production. 
I think I saw read just now it's 70 percent of agricultural land in the world is used for geared towards livestock production. Uh, so that is a huge uh, impact on uh, food production. In addition to these problems, there are changing patterns in uh, time and amount of rainfall due to climate change or other irregularities in temperature. And this is also serious because rain-fed farming uh, <laughs> counts for about 70% of the world's food. Uh, there is uh, centralization towards uh, large food empires, which presses the prices both to the farmers and to the producers. And in short, the globalization of agriculture, which also you could say started uh, seriously in, in the mid 90s, has therefore spread non sustainable industrial agriculture and destroyed many of small farmers' livelihood. Um, so this whole situation uh, caused me to try to focus uh, my PhD work on some of the reasons and look at if uh, people working on this situation rather than continuing with the uh, HIV prevention and the closely health-related issues I was working with in the US at the time. On the right, you see uh, poster. It's made by an organization in India called Navdanya, which I'll get back to, which is one of the organizations I worked with. Uh, you can see uh, their view on how uh, today's free trade has not improved the situation of uh, hunger and famine in India. First, uh, during um, colonization in 1877, there was a large famine. There has been many more periods or the famine is, uh, famines in different uh, areas of India, but these are the larger ones where millions of people have died. Uh, three, four million in 1942, where much of the grain in India was sent away by the British to allies during the Second World War. And uh, due to trade uh, issues, they would argue in 2001, So um, I lived uh, about uh, eight, uh, eight, ten years in Connecticut, and during that time I was a member of an organization called Northeast Organic Farming Association. And in 2004, uh, Navdanya's leader, Vandana Shiva, gave the um, keynote speech there, and she talked about the way to feed the world in the future would be uh, through the help of millions of farmers and millions of microbes instead of a focus on a few crops and a few companies in agribusiness. So I thought that uh, sounded interesting and I wanted to look at how they did that work or argue to do that work. So I uh, joined the course they have at the school in uh, Dehradun in Uttaragand in northwestern India. Uh, called School of Seed, uh, to see how they work with farmers. There are also, <laughs> as you see, of the group of students here, uh, students from all over, all over the world who come there. And I found their approach uh, very interesting and very interesting the interaction they had with the farmers. So I decided to focus on that for my PhD research. And one of my, or some of my key research questions are, uh, who are these farmers who would be um, informed and uh, convinced or uh, taught to convert uh, to organic agri agriculture? We call it here an alternative model because by this that time, at least in Punjab, many of the agricultural, uh, large agricultural production areas in India, the Green Revolution, which was uh, introduced in the 1960s, was all encompassing. So organic, were in Punjab, uh, organic farming is alternative. In other smaller states and the remote areas, it's still the current or the default. Uh, so I wanted to see how they could inform 
often and teach the farmers these often complex issues, for example, explaining about patenting of seeds, why it would be important to keep your traditional seeds, how you could uh, manage and learn again how to use uh, fertilizer and pest control management after having use, being taught how to use uh, chemicals for years. Uh, so I looked at uh, the work of several organizations. Navdanya is one of them. They work in several states. Uh, Keti Verasat, uh, uh, meaning the heritage of farming, works mainly in uh, Punjab. And I also worked with other organizations in uh, West Bengal and Tamil Nadu. I will focus today on Punjab and Uttarakhand because they are two very different states, one high uh, input very mechanized agriculture in Punjab, one of the most modern agricultural states in India, and Punjab, which is one of the least developed, where, for example, none of the farmers I talked to own the tractor. Uh, I wanted to look at, uh, again, wh who, wh which of the farmers adopted this new, and why, and why not, if they were afraid of or refused to do it or didn't find it useful. Uh, many of these organizations are not purely farmers' organizations. They call themselves social movements, and they work a lot on political aspects, informing the farmers, empower, uh, empowering them, as they call it, informing them how is the situation of food production today, their rights to food. Uh, so they call this a social... Uh, movements and that's why I also wanted to see whether they, uh, the farmers perceived that they would actively and consciously resist mainstream industrialized agriculture through this new model. So some of them see it as a political protest also what they do, but of course uh, basically a way of living and uh, their livelihood. Um, I wanted to uh, spend a lot of time uh, in uh, doing participant observation, which is uh, one of the basic and I think a very valuable method in anthropology or the social sciences. Uh, I do not uh, like a service, at least for this purpose, where you talk to many people who might not uh, read very well. The average uh, educational level of the farmers I talked to were uh, four years. Uh, I think you learn so much more <coughs> by participating in their daily lives and often what people say, for example, in a short survey is very different from what they do, not because they're lying, but just because it's very difficult to explain yourself well in a survey where the answers are given beforehand, kind of, and you just have to tick off. So, uh, no survey. I had uh, 89 in-depth interviews, who last, which last um, maybe an hour, some more, uh, maybe half an hour, and several with the same person. And I have uh, focus groups interviews. Sometimes when people are shy or it's hard to get a discussion going, it's good to put them in a group and they can discuss a topic and I would record it. I would record all the interviews and have them uh, transcribed and translated. I did uh, speak uh, some Hindi. I would uh, studied it a little before going to India and in India, so I could do small talk with the farmers. Uh, luckily, also many farmers and other people in India speak uh, English. But I worked in four different uh, states with, to some extent, different languages. Punjabi and uh, Bengali is very close to Hindi, which they talk in Uttarakhand. Well, Tamil, which I speak in the South, is completely different. So I, al I always had with me a research assistant who also spoke the local language, who would serve as an interpreter. So you see Punjab uh, up here in the northwest. Uh, it's a small state, but it has uh, most of the state's is, uh, agricultural uh, land, I think over 70%. In Dehradun, it's... Uh, uh, it's a mountainous state. It was, it's a relatively new state. It was separated from Uttar pra Pradesh, the most, one of the most popular states in India in 2000. So this is a small uh, mountainous state. I think 90% of the state 
is mountain, but you still have uh, agroforestry in the hills, but a very little uh, plain fields here. So I'll compare mostly these two states today. I also worked in Kolkata and up in Darjil Darjeeling. So I had in each state, I had a low land site and a higher land site to look at different uh, crops and different agroecological uh, situations. And in the Tamil, in Tamil Nadu, I worked in the uh, river delta here as well as in the mountain in the uh, uh, eastern part of the state. Uh, we start with some uh, pictures from uh, Punjab, which is called the breadbasket of India. They have a very high efficient uh, grain production. Uh, she's making chapati from wheat. Rice is not a traditional um, crop in Punjab, but was introduced with the Green Revolution. Uh, dung is a highly valued uh, commodity in Punjab. It's used both as firewood for building material, uh, some for uh, fertilizer. Uh, there are almost no trees left in Punjab. Everything's been chopped down and the, plain, the fields have been uh, planed out for rice cultivation. And they also lost all the traditional seeds uh, during the Green Revolution. Uh, in there are also uh, different and interesting cultural differences. I uh, observed as an anthropologist. Uh, of course, in uh, Punjab, you will not see any Punjabi women working out in the field. They would always work on the farm or inside. Uh, while in the next day, Uttarakhand, uh, women do maybe 80, 90% of the farm work. So they're out in the field all the time and the men just uh, take some of the important discussions and decisions uh, while drinking they do the, some of the plowing and sowing, but apart from that, uh, they are not very involved in agriculture. So here I uh, joined some women um, milking in uh, Punjab. You do see uh, other women in the field in Punjab. These are uh, women from Bihar. Uh, many would argue that the only reason also they could have a so-called successful green revolution working in Punjab is because they hired a large amount of cheap labor from other poorer states which are paid much less than they would pay a native Punjabi. Uh, native Punjabis don't work on other people's farm by the way, they just work on their own farm or on a friend's farm as a favor because they uh, it's below their dignity to work <coughs> as a farm workers on somebody else's farm. They are very good. They're known for being the best farmers in India, though. So it's not like they don't that they have anything against farm work. They are very proud uh, farmers, but they like to focus on their own farm. Uh, but in addition to the mechanization, the Green Revolution rely heavily on cheap labor from other states. Uh, here I'm interviewing. Uh, cotton picker. The farmer is standing and the translator is sitting next to me. This is a focus group with uh, conventional farmers. Uh, in my sample I have roughly half conventional farmers and half organic farmers. So it means that of course I was also very interested in learning why people did not so I didn't only talk to the people who had uh, converted. These farmers were aware of uh, the difficult uh, ecological or environmental situation in uh, Punjab. They wanted to convert, but they could not afford it. They are among the most heavily indebted farmers in the state. They borrow every year uh, for in order to be able to farm they borrow uh, for their inputs and they pay when, they, when the harvest is ready. And they cannot afford the uh, lower output in crop, which comes with normally during the conversion period at the first and second, sometimes the third year, you have a little lower input. 
uh, if you have not, uh, until the uh, soil uh, gains uh, normal fertility again. So uh, we had the interesting discussions and they were understood uh, the situation, as I said, but they felt trapped in this system and could not uh, escape to convert. If you notice, many of them have a gray beard uh, and you could, this could look like a group of men in their, I don't know, 50s or maybe 60s. It's actually a group, the average age is um, mid, late 30s to early 40s. One of the side effects uh, other studies uh, show uh, in uh, Punjab, there are many health effects of the pollution in the agriculture there, which has going on uh, for decades. And one of them is early graying of the hair they have uh, higher cancer rates in many of the blocks of the state. Uh, Greenpeace did a study a few years ago showing that children uh, growing up, especially in the cotton areas where they've been using more pesticides, have later uh, development. They can, they measured, for example, they cannot stand on one leg for uh, many seconds because they have poor balance. Uh, there, I'm mentioned some of this health research which I've uh, I discuss in the book uh, or in my other work uh, so uh, I rely on others who have done that even if I'm a medical anthropologist I did not look into that but there is uh, increasingly research on the negative health uh, side effects uh, in Punjab for example and other places in India. I must add that uh, this is also because they don't use the pesticide and the inputs the way they're supposed to because even if this has been uh, taught by agricultural extension workers for decades, it was kind of uh, forced on them, maybe many said, in a way without much teaching. Many of them cannot read and write. Many of them do their own mixing of pesticides. Many of them use, all the farms I talked to use way more urea, for example, than what they're supposed to because when they see it grows and it's green, they think the more the better. So there's a lot of uh, unnecessary pollution also because of not rightful use of uh, what they're using. This is uh, from the simple office of uh, Kete Virasa. They do have some support of uh, uh, not government in this state, but uh, private funders. So they do have uh, several agronomists working, uh, helping the farmers uh, to convert. The pesticide companies and others rely also on, uh, you see the instruction in writing here is very little, but they do have a picture and show the size of the plant. So this is uh, one way there is um, um, too little information about how to use uh, chemicals uh, properly. Punjab has uh, been, uh, most of the land has been conventional since the Green Revolution was introduced there as one of the first states in India in the 60s and serious uh, health effects that you could, uh, side effects that you could see of course on the land is salination, desertification and very low water tables in an increasing number of blocks. So there you simply have to stop uh, uh, growing anything because the water tables, when the water tables are low it means that they have been pumping up water from the ground for decades, so th they are so low that now they can't reach it anymore. And of course it was also the more uh, wealthy farmers, although most of the farmers in Punjab you can say are wealthy compared to the rest of India. Uh, but it's a high cost also in diesel and machinery to pump up the water. As I mentioned, all the native varieties uh, were lost. And the interesting uh, or the reason some are converting now is then both in to gain independence in terms of seed and on the farm inputs. Uh, but it, it's a controversial and stigmatized thing because for example in the village you buy uh, seed and all the inputs from the local, it's a one store where you buy everything, you get it on credit 
by returning your yield. If you don't buy it there, you don't get loans to any other things. And some places you're called like the village idiot if you don't continue using the regular inputs. But uh, that is why this, uh, the organizations who work with the farmers are very important because they give them moral and social support to uh, assist them during converting. Because it is, uh, in other states it's different and you have more people working in the alternative sector. But in places like uh, Punjab, you really have to be tough and kind of stand up and take a lot of uh, shit, to put it like that, in order to dare to convert. And people would say, you know, don't you want, don't you like progress? Don't you want to become rich? Are you spoiling the land for your children? Things like that. Punjab has uh, many canals, which was uh, built uh, several, uh, some of them several hundred years ago and during colonization. But unfortunately, uh, much of this water is uh, very polluted. They did use, for example, DDT many years. In, uh, it's now not used in agriculture as such, but it's used in public health uh, context, so it still pollutes the water canals. Uh, here is uh, the founder of Ketevarasat in the middle, his son on the right and his grandson on the left for you. And this is an uh, insect trap where they put up a light in the night and it's a kind of a sweet soup there and it works very well. They have them <coughs> spread out in the field and it catches all the insects <coughs> with no pesticide use in this, uh, in this example. So organic farming in Punjab is still very small. Uh, most of them are some small farmers, but also some larger farmers have converted. Uh, some of the smaller do it because they have the moral support of this organization. Some of the larger doing do it because they have higher education and they have read about it and they can afford to do it. They can afford to set aside land and buy the uh, expensive dung, for example. Most who convert or who have larger land do it little by little. For example, 10% of the land per year because otherwise it would be very hard and costly to get hold of so much input to restore the soil and to get uh, life back into the soil, so to say, if you do it you know, all in at once. Uh, here you see a biogas. Uh, plant with uh, the dung being swept straight into a tank below ground and then you have a cable with uh, gas going into the kitchen and this is uh, of course very useful for many reasons. Uh, one of the uh, serious health issues for women in India and other also other countries is <coughs> the smoke uh, pollution and uh, uh, negatively affecting um, by breathing in when you use firewood and cow dung and other things to burn with to cook. Whether you worse, of course, when you do it inside, but also when you do it outside, and it also affects uh, children a lot who normally gather together around the fireplace together with the mother. Uh, this uh, is subsidized by the government uh, some places. In Punjab, most uh, people could afford buying it. All mm, people have electricity. In other states, it would often be too costly. So then I moved to Uttarakhand, which, uh, as I uh, showed earlier, is uh, just to the right or just to the east of uh, Punjab, but uh, still uh, very different because it is the mountainous, uh, a mountainous state. And they have uh, completely other uh, issues, a fragile ecosystem, uh, and they use uh, agroforestry. Um, three of the highest uh, mountains in India are uh, located here. So you have from uh, mountainous, I mean, uh, snow-covered mountains and glaciers down to 
deciduous fo forest on the lower uh, areas. This is the northernmost uh, field site I had in uh, a mountain, mountain area called Uttarkashi. Uh, it's about 3,000 meters. You see the uh, uh, growth is very different from in Scandinavia. In Norway, we don't even have mountains as high, but definitely no trees at that level. But here they grow both, uh, for example, peaches and trees in between, and rice and wheat and uh, vegetables. Uh, this is a so-called uh, Navdanya village. It means that Navdanya work with many villages where they, the whole village uh, convert. Normally, many of these villages have been what they call organic by default. It means that they're so remote and often farmers are so small and so poor that they have never had the money or the access through transportation to start using fertilizer or other inputs. But it doesn't mean that the agriculture was very effective. So Navdan and organis other organizations still have a very important job to do here in teaching them new techniques and uh, better ways of doing organic more productive. It's, um, there were many lovely villages. You see most of the houses are of wood and with uh, stone covered roofs. So they look very pristine and you couldn't even get hold of paper or something to pollute with. This is uh, one of the states uh, where uh, it's not the worst for women, I think that's uh, Uttar Pradesh, but it's high up on the list where women work uh, roughly, they would say, 14 hours a day, while men work maybe seven. And as I mentioned, in addition <coughs> to farming, women also are responsible for here gathering fodder to the animals and taking care of the family and cooking and the children, of course. During colonization, uh, areas like uh, the forests were taken over by the state. Uh, prior to that, they had been areas called the commons, where everybody could use, take timber for your house, nothing for sale, but timber for your house, fodder for your animals, or use uh, freely. Uh, after colonization, that was um, some of it was sold, some was uh, some is still owned by the state, but it's um, continuing contention between state and farmer over the use because the farmers in these areas really need the resources of the forest in order to be able to feed the animals and uh, live. Uh, the monsoons have been irregular in the last years here. There is a high, um, there's a glacier uh, where which are they take picture of it every year and it's uh, reducing, it's been reduced with several meters every year. So <laughs> there are serious uh, climate change uh, that affects uh, this state and they uh, really need to keep uh, the work of agroforestry and the native sorts uh, alive in order to adjust to this uh, climate change. They are also because of the very high uh, differences in altitude, for example, they do have a very large variety, very high biodiversity in this state. And the average actually of species grown by farmers in this state is 40. So they, but that includes uh, grains, cereals, vegetables, but also herbs and medicinal plants. So many has as a side income to grow medicinal plants and herbs, which is both used uh, nationally in the local uh, medical systems, Ayurveda, but also exported for oils uh, for different uh, international uh, wellness industry and other things. Uh, here you see some neat uh, terraced fields, a little uh, at the lower elevation, where they grow uh, red rice, uh, organic in this case which is said to have antioxidant and cancer prevention uh, um, qualities. And it's sold uh, often in Delhi and other large cities. I can mention that there is a large uh, demand for organic produce in India. 
India has uh, a middle class of 350 million people. And for them, uh, food is uh, not expensive, of course, and they are willing and happy to pay a little more for organic produce. A main issue for many of the small farms is, of course, transportation, because at the local market, people might not be willing to pay more. And uh, there is a severe lack or serious lack of infrastructure in many of these mountainous states. In this state, I think they, when I was there, about 5,000 villages were still not connected to a road, for example. And many do not have electricity or water. Uh, this is just a close-up of some uh, cute uh, small uh, uh, vermi compost uh, matter, which is one of the techniques they teach many of the farmers there to improve the soil. They create small pits, uh, cement pits on each farm, so you can have your own production of uh, the vermi compost, which is very effective to make the soil. Uh, uh, fertile. Uh, Uttarakhand was declared India's first organic uh, state and it's one of the few states where farmers actually get some of the subsidies uh, if you do also if you do organic farming but it's still not uh, completely organic in any way you still find shops like this one that uh, sell uh, chemical fertilizers mineral fertilizers and pesticides um, but they do have uh, uh, interest, the state has an interest in uh, keeping up the production of many of these specialty uh, pro products, which you cannot grow anywhere else in India. I mean, maybe you can grow them in other mountain areas like in Darjeeling, but that is, um, there you have mostly tea production. But uh, because of the, these are grown at higher elevation, you can't grow them in other more uh, plain areas of the country and also uh, they have uh, because of the temperature you have them they can only grow uh, in these mountains not in the mountains in southern India for example which have much higher temperature uh, some of you have uh, maybe heard of or read things by uh, Vandana Shiva who is uh, the founder of Navdanya as I mentioned earlier and uh, they have a research farm, as I mentioned, also where they have the uh, seed school of seed. And she regularly lectures there and work with the coordinators. Uh, Navdanya's coordinators work uh, mainly almost unpaid. It is farmers who live in the respective villages and they are invited to the research farm uh, once a month or in between to get training and then they travel back to their village and work with the villagers and with the other farmers. Do they get paid for the travel, even though they're uh, yes, yes, they do get uh, travel refunded and lodging and also they get a small amount like 1000 rupees a month or something as a small additional uh, help for, for doing the job. Uh, I do think it works uh, pretty well in many cases. They are very active and very involved in what they do. But I, I must say that I saw several other organizations that do invest some money in the people who work with them and, could, and who could have, uh, for example, people with bachelors in agriculture working, that many of those organizations uh, work uh, more professionally with the farmers and that often it's good to have uh, not just the local farmers uh, working with the farmers but uh, they do a good effort in training the coordinators so it does work well and they do work in 16 states in India so they're a large organization uh, spreading out uh, traveling not just traveling around but I mean they have local contacts in many states this is a glimpse into Navdanya's uh, seed bank. <coughs> One of the main or important work of these organizations is to help the farmers uh, keep alive the seeds they have for the different uh, conditions. Uh, in this and other seed banks, and mostly in this large one, all the farmers who come by get seeds for free and you just uh, return, if you have a good harvest, you return 
sum to the seed bank and if it fails, you don't need to return anything. So it's a completely free service. They do have uh, impressive uh, variety here and they do have, for example, I mean, there was uh, even larger variety in India of thousands of types of rice. And for example, uh, during the tsunami, uh, Navdanya and other people in West Bengal helped uh, provide the uh, rice that can withstand salt water. So you could grow in the areas that have been over flooded with salty water. And they have for, of course, very wet, very dry condition and all kinds of altitudes. And this is, uh, of course, the reason why they do it is, I mean, you, you keep a cultural heritage and cultural knowledge, which is, which is very important. But in addition, you have a variety that you can use to grow at in during all kinds of conditions, which the new hybrid seeds often do not work well, being developed far away from where they're going to be gr uh, grown. Uh, they often do not do... Uh, grow well and they often require, I mean, in order to do well, they often require uh, much more, more water, fertilizer, other things that is an ad additional cost for the small farmers with the, which they often cannot afford. Or they do uh, risky business and, and spend a lot of money on buying it and buying the accompanying um, fertilizer, for example, and then if it fails, they're in uh, problems economically. And there's been a wave of suicides among uh, small Indian farmers. Uh, it's a long wave. It started in the 1980s. It's been up and down. But many argue that, of course, the, the high cost of uh, agricultural inputs is a large uh, reason for the debt. And then again, uh, people commit suicide if the debt go out on hand and they can't manage it. Uh, this is um, another local uh, seed bank. This belongs to one farm. This is uh, Reka, which was my youngest uh, participant. If uh, I'm not sure if you have this kind of uh, storage houses in Swedish farms, but in Norwegian farms we also have, we call them stabur, and people traditionally used to keep their food there. And they still do it in many, most of Uttarakhand, there is no electricity. So they store grains and also the seed, uh, of course, but in these uh, seed banks. And because it's in so important buildings, they often carve them out and decorate them. And many of them were hundreds of years old. And they shield them very well, as you see here on high stones in case of flooding, since there's a hillside, and also from wind and sun and <laughs> rain with the roofing. Uh, some, yeah, some seed banks, uh, some farmers had their own, and some villages had a common seed bank. These are some of the tough, uh, productive female farmers. And as I mentioned, in Uttarakhand, none of the farmers I work with had uh, uh, tractors, so they hear, and uh, here also they're harvesting the old-fashioned way. So it's uh, hard work. Uh, mm, jumping over to uh, West Bengal and Darjeeling, just to show that they were, uh, this is also a or completely organic village over there. Uh, that uh, the conversion to organic is happening uh, all over India to smaller and larger extent in different states. Uh, this is a highly educated farmer. If you Google his name, you will find uh, many of his uh, uh, um, publications free online to access. But he's one of the farmers who are committed to saving a lot of seeds. So he has a huge farm. He grows many of the seeds, not every day, but uh, in between a year or two to keep them alive. He's uh, now moved to Orissa, by the way, because it became too dry in West Bengal, where he was uh, located. Um, an example of how the farm organization 
it's also deal with uh, political uh, education. You see maybe some uh, old uh, known figures in the back here. This is uh, West Bengal, one of the states where the Communist Party is strong. It's West Bengal and um, um, next to Tamil Nadu, and uh, Kerala. In Kerala, it's worked uh, very well with land reforms. In West Bengal, it hasn't worked uh, that well. So there, there are some land reforms, but not to the same extent. So I'll uh, go a little faster. Um, focus group with uh, Muslim farmers in uh, West Bengal, also in Muslim areas, of course, no females in the field, uh, nor in the focus groups. It looks uh, idyllic with no roads and electricity, but it's not so fun uh, when you have to walk there and it's uh, slippery, where you wh when you have no cold storage and maybe your potatoes rot before you get them to the market, uh, where you dry uh, fruits in this case uh, in order to preserve them. Uh, these are containers to save uh, uh, store grain. And the so, uh, soil completely dries out. So when the, these are also farmers who have no, uh, cannot afford um, irrigation. So then they grow only one or two crops after the monsoon. Even the cows, which are sometimes fed before, not before people necessarily, but before uh, girls sometimes, were really skinny in West Bengal. Um, they have a pond on each of the farms often, which is used for both bathing, fishing, and washing your clothes, so not very hygienic. A uh, lot of uh, child labor in West Bengal, people, uh, kids who would work all day instead of going to school. Uh, farmers have a side income of selling women's hair. They pick, they don't cut the hair, but they pick it from the brush every day. Every day. It's sorted and it's sold to China, which makes uh, wigs. In India, they don't have the, uh, the con factories to make wigs of them, then they would have earned a lot more. Instead, they sell the raw material kind of cheaply to China, which may uh, ripe the benefit because uh, human hair for wigs is uh, highly priced in the West. Organic uh, vegetables farmers also in the South, Tamil Nadu. Women weeding, weeding is a typical female job. This is also an organic rice field. Um, organic rice from a small organization called Poison Free Producers Association. Another example of an organization that works with uh, farmers in Tamil Nadu where they had uh, one organization called Center for Indigenous Knowledge System had uh, quite uh, good funding. Okay, so I'm going to uh, stop here with the key findings. So it is uh, possible, definitely, to convert whether it is from an intensive conventional system, as in Punjab, or in a, with very small holdings in difficult uh, terrain, like in Uttarakhand, and still make a good livelihood. I mean, enough for a family to live uh, okay off of. And the organizations who work with the farmers are very important because they give, as I mentioned, uh, practical and uh, moral support in a period where it's, uh, they feel they go through a risky and uncertain period changing how they make their living. And uh, I would argue that uh, even if they still remain poor, uh, many of these farmers do not become rich. Many of them are able to pay off their debts, though, so they do become economically independent after a period of a few years. And just that uh, condition or situation of having control over inputs and productions would uh, they also call uh, really empowering. Okay, I had some more. We can, if somebody stays on, we can. Uh, 
discuss uh, further issues, but I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much.